Welcome to section three of The Never-Ending World, and we're going to be talking about Bible manuscripts and how languages change over time. And we're going to begin by asking, what is a manuscript? Uh, where, do our, where do our Bibles come from? Which manuscripts were used to make up our Bibles? And how difficult was it to write a manuscript in the ancient world? Okay, This is crucial for understanding our history, the different possibilities of what the Bible might be saying, and how we can completely debunk the end of the world and prove that the second coming of Christ already happened. And this will completely shatter Judaism, Islam, and Zionist Christianity. Okay, This is like the Achilles heel or the self-destruct button to all this, you know, all this religious nonsense that's going on. So none of these religions can stand if the second coming of Christ already happened. Okay, they're all lies and frauds. And you can, you can just use the words of Jesus to end all of this, okay? So let's look at Luke 21. We're, we're going to start section 4 with this. And uh, this is where we're really going to get into more of the, the book of Revelation and um, going over the history that happened during this era. But let's look at Luke 21. I want you to really read this here, okay? So when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that, desolation, that the desolation thereof is nigh. Let them which are in New York... No, England, London, no, Berlin, no, Judea, very specific region here. Let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. So let's really think about this. All things which are written may be fulfilled when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies. So when are all things written? When are they going to be fulfilled? Well, do you believe Jesus when he says when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies? And he's talking to people in Judea. He's not talking to the people of the world. If this was a world event, it wouldn't be local. It would be, hey, everyone in the world, pay attention to this. So do you believe Jesus when he says this? Now let's look at another verse. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So we really have two options here. You either believe what Jesus is saying or you don't. You either believe that, that people, that this is over. Jesus is in his kingdom. He's ruling. This is all over. People in front of him will not taste death till they see the, the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So you either believe in 2,000-year-old zombies that are still walking the earth, or you, the other option is you believe this already happened. Those are your only two options. So uh, when will all things written be fulfilled? When you see Jerusalem surrounded, compassed with armies. Jesus is not saying people in 2,000 years from now, when, Israel, when the Jews return to Jerusalem and Judea and rebuild their country, and they rebuild their temple and it gets destroyed again, and then when you see, it's not, it's, look, the, the Jerusalem's going to be surrounded by armies within 40 years of Jesus saying this. So you either believe Jesus or you don't. And that's what you have to kind of decide. So just with a few verses, I know I can really prove my point and really end this whole Middle East nonsense with the Jews just by reading the words of Jesus. Now, we're going to cover this in great detail because there's a lot more being said here than people think, okay? This is going to tie into the laws of Moses, and Jesus is really asking the Jew, or telling the Jews, you're going to have to make a decision. You're either going to follow me or follow Moses, because the Moses Mosaic law is going to be destroyed here, and anyone who chooses Moses over Jesus is going to either die or be sold into slavery, okay? So we'll cover this in great detail, detail in the next section, okay? But for now, we're going to talk about uh, manuscripts, Bible manuscript history. We're going to go over composing a manuscript, Translations versus transliterations, the King James Bible, 1611, and how languages change over time. When it comes to Bible manuscript history, okay, so we have to cover this and compare the differences between the Greek, the Greek and the Hebrew manuscript. If I had to sum, sum up the problems and the discord with the translations, I would say that it has to do with the Aryan Greek and Semitic Hebrew conflict, okay, so the Aryan and Semitic culture clash. And we're going to see this with the two languages and how words get lost in translation going from one language to another. This is also going to take us back to the history of Noah, and we're going to see what the Bible says about the Aryans and the Semites, and the prophecy given to Noah's sons, and how all of world history really hangs on this one amazing prophecy. Then we're going to move to composing a manuscript, 
And this is extremely important. You know, I, I often hear people, you know, demanding to see a Bible manuscript from the time of Moses or from the time of Jesus before they will even consider believing in the Bible. And it's normal to want to see an original source, okay? But this is obviously, you know, insane since they're asking us to produce something that really isn't possible to do because we don't live in a world where things last forever, especially for thousands and thousands of years. Okay? And once we have a better understanding of how brutally difficult and how expensive it was to compose a manuscript, especially in the ancient world, and even still today, people still do it using the ancient style. They still, they still make manuscripts like this. And then when you add the violent history surrounding the Bible and the persecution of Christians, you'll understand exactly why it was impossible and why it is, you know, why it's impossible to have a manuscript from the time of Jesus or from Moses. And I'm guilty of this too. I used to demand the originals. I used to say, how do we know we can trust the Bible and it hasn't been changed? I would think of any excuse to be lazy so I didn't have to read this giant book that would drastically change my life and force me to submit to a higher authority. The truth is the Bible has been changed. We don't have the originals um, and we do have a lot of work ahead of us. Um, but really when you know manuscript history and you understand how difficult and expensive composing a manuscript was, then it makes sense why we don't have a first century complete Bible. If anything, if there was a first century complete Bible with the Old Testament and the New Testament, it would work against us. It's actually really good for us that we don't have this because it doesn't match the history. It doesn't match the persecution. It doesn't match the violence that transpired during this time. So when people are claiming that Christianity was invented by Jews to enslave the world, if that were true, if it was some plan, then there would be lots of first century manuscripts. They would have been pumping them out like crazy. We gotta get our trick out and brainwash these people as fast as possible and you're just you're not going to have that you don't have first century manuscripts because people on the run who are running for their lives whose homes and and churches are being burnt down and they're being arrested and killed they're not going to have the money or time to write a manuscript okay so we'll cover that when we get to that section we're also going to talk about this is actually probably going to be my favorite uh, part because we're going to be looking at uh, words and understand how much power and responsibility comes with teaching the Bible. And what we're going to notice is that the version of Christianity taught today is completely based off transliterations and not translations. Okay, for example, if we look at the word Satan, it's a double transliterated word. So we have to understand what does that mean and how that can change the entire story of the Bible. So we're going to be comparing how the ancient Greeks would use these words or the ancient Hebrews would use these words and how they changed during the Christian Gnostic era. You know, we're going to look at the word Satan, how it's then brought into the Greek language, and then how, you know, Satan just becomes the Dark Lord Sauron. They take this word, apply new, new meanings and definitions to it, insert the word, create a new word, and then we now have the Dark Lord of the universe, Sauron. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to talk about that. Okay, we're also going to talk about the King James Bible. Um, since I was once a victim of the King James Onlyism cult. So there is this serious cult, you know, mainly around Southern Baptist preachers. You know, like those hellfire brimstone you better do what i say or else you'll burn in hell forever but god loves you those kind of pastors and that's something i i'll never do do you notice how i never threaten you with hell or try to scare you to agree with me i actually think that most atheists have a lot less to fear in death than the majority of christians today we're gonna, I'm going to try to end, actually, on the topic of hell, and we're going to see what the Apostle Paul says about this, just because this is a, this is a big point, and uh, this is a scary factor, and a lot of people can't wrap their minds around how man, how the churches pretty much teach that mankind is more merciful than God. And to me, I think that's really blasphemous. I think it's blasphemy to really say that we have more compassion and mercy than God, and it really voids the whole story of Jesus. These King James Onlyists uh, truly believe that they have the perfect word of God in English, 
that there's no point in checking the translations. Don't check the source material. You just believe what I'm selling you. This is like buying a car, but don't look under the hood. You know, you don't need to see the engine. You don't need to see the transmission. Just look at the shiny paint and trust the salesman, right? Would you buy a car without peeking under the hood to see exactly what you're buying? Do you buy a house without checking the foundation on which it was built upon? No, but King James only is due. They refuse to look under the hood to go, okay, well, how was my Bible made? And this is similar to Muslims. You know, Muslims also believe that the Arabic Quran is the perfect word of God and that we must learn Arabic to know what God is truly saying. And these King James onlyists believe the same thing, that you must speak English to have the perfect word of God. Okay, so I'm going to teach you how you can kind of destroy this argument and kind of show you some things you can use um, problems with the King James Bible where the, the Old Testament, you know, is, is made from the Hebrew, the New Testament's coming from the Greek, and there's a big difference between what the apostles are saying and what the Old Testament's saying. The, the apostles are clearly reading from a Septuagint Bible, which completely disagrees with their Hebrew Old Testament. So we're going to talk about that. And we're going to end with, kind of do some exercises. We're going we're gonna to end with how languages change over time. And we're just going to go over some examples of how words meant something in the past. And then over time, they just take on completely new meanings. And I'm actually going to teach this throughout the whole video, um, but uh, you know we're going to also look at a few things, and we have to take some things into consideration that when you're looking at languages like Hebrew and Greek, for instance, that um, Hebrew, for instance, has masculine and feminine, right? There's genders. English, we don't have genders. So when you're reading the English language, you know we don't have genders. Greek has three genders. It has masculine, feminine, and neuter. And if you don't speak a language that has um, feminine, masculine, and like genders, it's, it's, you have to understand uh, that when you're speaking these languages, there's like two to three times the vocabulary. There's a lot that these translators have to learn uh, about language. And we're also going to talk about declension, how we don't have that in English. So there's a lot to consider. And what I want to do is do an exercise we're going to look at the works of Geoffrey Chaucer and the Canterbury Tales, and we're going to see, you know, just how well any of us can actually understand Old English. So this is just so we can appreciate what the translators have to go through when they're reading much, much older ancient, ancient languages. We're just going to be looking at English from 600 years ago and see if we can understand what these people are saying. Okay, so once we have a better understanding of language, manuscripts, translations, transliterations, the conflict between Hebrew and Greek, the history leading up to it, um, and the conflict between Christians and Jews, then we can understand, you know, better understand at least why we're in this situation. Okay, so we are going to see motive, okay, and why the Jews had to purposely change the Bible, and how everything happening today, and almost all the problems in the world, are once again dancing around Jerusalem and the Jews, and the same sect of Jews who murdered Christ. And I want you to think about that. What are the odds that 2,000 years ago, Jesus was battling Pharisees and Gnostics, okay? People who had taken over the Roman Empire through religion, through usury, art, and theater. And today we are battling the sect of Pharisees who have perverted the Bible, stolen the name Israel, destroyed Christianity, and really have enslaved the world with debt while fabricating almost every major world conflict. And you look, I'm saying this as a Jew, okay? I'm descended from Pharisees. If anything, I'm probably a bastard Pharisee. Okay, my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, they were, they were Pharisees. They were dis slightly disconnected because of the Soviet Union, okay? My cousins are Pharisees uh, on my father's side. So as I teach this Aryan-Semitic conflict, which is very evident in history and, you know, th and by studying our Bible translations, understand I'm a half Pharisee. I come from an Orthodox Jewish, Orthodox Jewish family. Okay, but my mother, my mother is pure Aryan, okay? She's Irish, French, Canadian, and um, she's descended from Scandinavians and Germans, okay? So my mom is really, you know, her ancestors might be Irish and French, but that's just because 
they were Vikings, they were Scandinavians who settled there. So I'm really, if you really break down my history, I'm much more related to Scandinavians than I, and Germans than I am to ethnic French and Irish. But some of my Irish clans are actually the most like rebellious, the most hated clans in all of British Irish history. So the British hate my my Irish descendants are actually from like you know if you know the the story of the O'Neills, the O'Brennans. Um, I'm I'm descended from some of the most like hardcore anti-British Irish clan. But anyways, I'm just my point there is I'm in I'm a mix of the two cultures. So this is when I study the Aryan and the Semitic um, clash. I'm studying my two halves, and I don't have I, I'm I'm not biased towards any one of them. I want the truth. Okay, so that's I just wanted to point that out in case anyone wants to say, oh, you're just a Jew hater or or whatever. No, this is just my history, and I'm trying to figure it all out. Uh, I want to start at least before we start. I want to I want to go over um, just. Uh, my rules for how I study history. And this is called Tempus et Historia, and this means time and history, meaning that you can't study history without also trying to understand the time in which that history took place. Okay, so we have some rules, and the overall rule is to immerse yourself in the culture. Okay, you want to do your best to try to figure out things like, you know, how did they think? How did they speak? How did they live? And what was possible during their time? So you can't just read the history. You have to under, try your best to understand the perspective, the times in which that history was being written and taken place so you can better understand why, did they, why would they write this? What, what were their worldviews? What language did they speak? Okay, Because language is very crucial for how we interpret the world. And then as we interpret the world, we're now going to write it down and depending on what language you speak will deter, you know, will change the way that message is conveyed. Okay, so these are my rules for, for studying history, okay? And I just want you to understand that in the future, when people are looking back at our era and looking back at us, they will never fully understand 100% what life was like for you. They might have an idea, right, and especially if our videos and all this stuff kind of survive, which is kind of frightening, but the truth is only you know the full truth about you, your life, and the era which you lived through. Every one of us was trusted with a small piece of history and time, and it's like a puzzle piece, and only we know the truth about our own lives, okay? So you must consider the time with history. Okay, and the word history means to investigate or to inquire. So uh, the only way we can properly investigate the past is by understanding the time in which that history took place. So let's just, let me just give you an example. A man in 1 BC says to a man in 2000 BC, I can rain stones and fire down on a city. The man from 2000 BC would say impossible, only a god can do that. Because this technology just didn't exist. The idea that man would have the power to throw catapult balls, you know, lit on fire into cities is impossible to the man from 2000 BC. Likewise, someone from closer to our time says, I can fly across the world in a day. I can speak to people across the ocean. I can give sight to the blind. I can give hearing to the deaf. I can make the lame walk. I can revive people from death. I can even cause virgins to give birth. The man in 1 BC would say, impossible. Only a god can do that. So that is Tempus et Historia. You have to do your best to put yourself in the time in which the history that you're reading about took place. Let's talk about manuscripts and let's be like a good lawyer and define what we're talking about. So when I'm talking about manuscripts, uh, manuscript is derived from two Latin words, manu, okay, which means hand, and then script, which means to write or writing. So thus, a manuscript is that which is written by hand. We don't, they don't have printers. It's not like today where you can type, you know, 60 to 80 words a minute. These people have to create the parchment. They have to take the paper, create the paper or the parchment. 
Okay, paper is from papyri. This is an Egyptian word from the, Egypt, the plants that used to grow wild in ancient Egypt. From the papyrus plant is where we get our word paper, and it's still the same word from history. This word has actually never changed. And then we have parchment, and the difference between the two is parchment is really made from animal skin. And we're going to talk about this later. And this is lamp black. This would be the, we're going to talk about how this is made in the ancient world. And we're also going to talk about the stylus, which is really just a stick of metal or a stick of wood. And you'd have to dip your stylus into the ink, and then you would draw one part of the letter at a time. So instead of typing 60 to 80 words a minute, these guys are probably, you know, making one to three letters per minute. And we're also going to look about the style. There's no periods, there's no spaces, there's no commas. Numbers are also letters, so when you're looking at this block of a mess, we're going to do some exercises to see how well you guys can read, even me included, how well we can read from a manuscript. And we're going to see that later on. So this is what a manuscript is, is that which is written by hand. So now let's talk about scrolls versus codices. And uh, again, we're going to come to Latin, and codex really just means like block of wood or tree trunk, and I would say it's really that which is between the wood. Uh, Christians really popularized the use of codices, and we're going to go from using scrolls to now binding our scrolls in between two blocks of wood. And it's really Christians who popularized the codex. And this is really the, I would say the father, grandfather, whatever you want to call it, of, of the book is a codex. And they're generally made of parchment. They're made of the skin of animals. Scrolls weren't ideal. If you're a religion on the run, if you're a people who are constantly being persecuted and having your houses burned down, you don't want to be carrying a bunch of scrolls. It's much easier to bind all your scrolls in a protective cover so you can easily run with it. So that's why uh, Christians really popularized the use of a book. And Bible really means, in Greek, it means the book or the scroll. And that's uh, why the book really became the preference over the scrolls, okay? So it was just ideal for a people on the run. So these are the great uncial codices, and these are really the oldest, most complete manuscripts we have, you know, Codex uh, Sinaiticus, Codex Alexandrinus, Codex Vaticanus, and Codex Ephraimi Rescriptus. And these are our oldest manuscripts, and none of these manuscripts agree. They're all in ancient Greek, and they have different books. Um, they, and they've got, and they're not complete, okay? And what I notice is a lot of them are missing Genesis, the genealogies. But these will be the main, the main Greek Septuagint manuscripts we have. And if you notice the date, the dates of them, they're really when the Roman Empire was starting to become Christian, okay? We're not really going to have... We have a lot of fragments going back even to the 2nd century BC, and then we can easily take the fragments that we have and lay them on top of the, co the, 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 the nearly complete manuscripts we have and see if they match, which in most cases they do. Okay, so we're going to talk about language now, and again we're going to define what we talk about. Language is going to come from the Latin word linga, and it means either language or tongue. And we've kind of lost this in modern English, where it's, um, we'll just do a comparison here. So in modern English, you know, we have tongue and language, and we don't really call our language a tongue anymore. You might be able to get away with saying, my mother tongue, right, is English, my mother tongue is French. But we really separate this, where in Old English, they're actually the same, the same word. So if we go to, here's the Apostolic Bible, it's a very direct and literal translation, and then we have the King James, which is, uh, you know, a more, it's a, it's a cleaner, it's not literal, it's not, they're not just going to take every word and literally translate it. And you're going to notice gifts of diversity of tongues, okay, which just means languages, it's someone who's gifted in speaking languages. You know, I have some friends, they speak six, six seven languages fluently, okay, I, I know people that speak English and French better than I do, and it was their third or fourth language, and they speak my own language better than me because, you know, they use words I just don't understand. Their grammar is flawless, and they just have a gift of languages, like the Apostle Paul had a gift of languages. This is not saying what these crazy Pentecostals are doing, okay? So when these atheists walk into these crazy Pentecostal churches, and they see these people behaving like zombies, falling on the ground, speaking in gibberish, 
and everyone's saying, oh, that's speaking in tongues. That's not what the Bible's saying. We can clearly see that this is about language. And these crazy Pentecostals are one of the most dangerous sects of Christians because intelligent people who stick their head inside one of these evangelical Pentecostal churches and sees these people falling on the ground, you know, doing the funky chicken, um, you know, speaking in nonsense, and they think, these atheists now think, oh, this is Christianity, these people are mentally insane. And what you're going to notice is a lot of these Christian pastors that run these charismatic speaking in tongues churches, they have business degrees and psychology degrees. And to me, they're just a bunch of, a bunch of criminals taking advantage of a bunch of gullible people. And they're using psychology and business to, to make a fortune and just destroy Christianity. Okay, they're one of the most dangerous sects of Christians, I would say. And uh, just to, to kind of give you an example, if we were to go to French, right, and we were to say, quel langue partout, right? I'm asking you, this is tongue, lang, uh, linga, and I'm asking which language do you speak? Okay, what language do you speak? That's what I'm asking in French if I were to say quel langue partout. And if I were to say ta langue, I could be saying your language or your tongue. In French, this has the same meaning. You'd have to let me finish. You know, you'd have to know the context of what I'm talking about to know if I'm talking about your language or your tongue. In Russian, you're going to have the same thing. If I said moi yizik ruski, okay, I'm saying my language is Russian. If I were to just say moi yizik, I'm either saying my language or my tongue. Okay, so language is super important. It's how we view the world. Someone who grows up speaking Arabic is not going to view the world the same, and they're not going to be able to convey um, the same messages to you speaking Arabic and learning about the world through the Arabic language as someone who grew up speaking English or French, right? We're all going to see the, word, the world through the language that we speak and try to interpret what we're seeing through our language. So language is absol absolutely crucial, and it's important to understand that you can't say certain things in Spanish, you know, I, I had lots of times in my life where I'm, I, you know, some of my friends are, are native Spanish speakers or native um, Arabic speakers, and they, they just they just tell me, you know, I, I want to tell you something, but I just don't know how to say it in English because it, it won't translate the same way. Okay, so language is very crucial. Okay, now I want us to look at something very fascinating. These are the languages of the manuscripts, okay? We're going to have Egyptian Coptic, we're going to have Syriac, which is also Aramaic, we're going to have Greek, we're going to have Latin, Aramaic Hebrew, and then Paleo-Hebrew, which is also called Phoenician. And what do you notice about the manuscripts left to us, the languages? They're telling a story. Okay, I'm going to give you a clue. And what do you notice? That we have ancient Egyptian preserved in the Greek alphabet. So we have the language spoken by the ancient Egyptians. We have the languages spoken by the, the, the Assyrian, the Babylonian, and the Medo-Persian empires. That's Syriac or Imperial Aramaic. We have ancient Greek left to us by the, the, the Hellens of the ancient Greeks. And we have Latin by the, from the Romans. Okay, So this is, to me, very beautiful. These, these are the legacies of these empires, is the languages that they left us. And all our manuscripts are telling the same story as the Bible, just the languages on their own. And they're the legacies of these great empires that we are, we are all descended from these empires. And now we're going to zoom in a little bit closer on this because this is also telling another story. Let's, let's zoom in here and let's talk about the house of Judah versus the house of Israel. So here we have the, the Jewish Bible, the Masoretic, and you're going to notice it's not written in Hebrew. The Samaritan Pentateuch here is written in a more authentic this would be the script Moses would have written in. And this here is the Hebrew language, but written in an Aramaic style. And when did the, when did the Jews switch? That when they were captives in Babylon, when they went into the Babylonian Empire that spoke Aramaic, Syriac, and they're now going to change their script to, and adapt it more to their captivity. And this is when the Jews switched from using Paleo-Hebrew and are now using an alphabet system more similar to the region they're now captives in. And this is when the Bible style changed. So it's telling us the story. Even the, 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 the Jewish Bible is telling us the same story from the Bible. And that's why they're writing in this script. And then when we come to Paleo-Hebrew, the Israelites who stayed in Samaria, they became like a, a, a mixture 
The Assyrians filled Israel up with other people, and the Samaritans are really a mixture of the the lowest class, the probably the farmers, the slaves of northern Israel that were left behind. Also, the Israelites who came back after their captivity, some of them did come back and resettle in, in, in northern Israel, northern Palestine, northern Canaan, and uh, the Jews absolutely despised them. There's this, the, 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 the Samaritans are really bastard Israelites, mixed blood Israelites, um, that have no, uh, no uh, records of their genealogy. And that's what the Samaritan Pentateuch is. And we're going to look at some differences. So don't get, don't get confused with this term Phoenician. Okay, understand that uh, Phoenicia is, it could be Syria, it could be Lebanon, it could be Israel, it could be Edom. The Greeks referenced that whole coast of the Mediterranean as Phoenicia. The Israelites didn't call themselves Phoenicians. The Phoenicians didn't call themselves Phoenicians. They called themselves the Canoi, the Canaanites from Tyre and Sidon, and from northern Israel. And this term Phoenician is a Greek term, just like the Greeks didn't call themselves Greeks. The Romans called them Greeks. The, the Greeks called themselves Hellens. The Egyptians didn't call themselves Egyptians. They, they were from Kemet. They were from uh, you know, Mizraim. They're not, they're not, they would never call themselves Egyptians. This is what we call them, just like Phoenician. Okay, And this is where we're going to get the word Punic. Uh, Phoenicia okay, became Punici, and Phoenici, and this is where we're going to get the Punic language with the Carthaginians and the Romans. We're going to talk about that another time. So understand the differences between this is really a Bible from left behind by the northern Israelites, and this is a Bible left to us from the southern tribe of Judah. And we're going to look at a difference here. And if you go to a Samaritan Pentateuch, you go to the, the northern Israelite Torah, this verse is added. Go to your Bibles, go to your Septuagint, go to your Masoretic, and you're going to notice that this is not in, in your Bibles. This is only in the Samaritan Pentateuch. And we're just going to look at this word, Mount Gerizim. And the reason why it's here is that they're saying that God and Moses commanded them to build an altar here. And that this is where you're going to worship, in Mount Gerizim, which is in northern Israel. It's in Ephraim. So now when you go to the New Testament and you read the woman in Samaria, so when Jesus is in northern Israel, he's in Samaria talking to the Samaritan woman, what are we going to notice? That this woman is confused. And now we're going to understand why she's confused. And the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So this woman's confused because she clearly believes that it's in, in Mount Gerizim, in Ephraim, in northern Israel. This is where we're supposed to worship. But you Jews don't think so. Well, why does she think that? It's because in northern Israel, they're using the Samaritan Pentateuch that commands them to worship there. And Jesus says unto, unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you don't know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Okay, It's going to come from Jerusalem. It's going to come from Jesus. It's going to come from, from the, the kingdom of Judah. But the hour is coming, and it is now, when true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is not going to be worshipped in one spot. He's not going to be worshipped in Jerusalem. It's going to be destroyed. The old covenant's going to be destroyed. The Bible's going to be fulfilled, and God will be worshipped throughout the world. And that's what Jesus is saying here. And the reason this woman's confused is because of the writings, the corruptions done by the northern Israelites saying that you have to worship in Ephraim. So there was a civil war between the house of Israel. Notice the difference. Here we have the son of Solomon, Rehoboam, and he's going to go to war, the house of Judah, this is the Jews, and they're going to fight who? The house of Israel. The Jews are not Israel. Okay, They're the house of Judah. They were at war with Israel. Okay, And Rehoboam's trying to bring the kingdom back together. So what happened was, when, Je when Rehoboam lost this battle, he lost this war, he, Jeroboam, the king of northern Israel, kicked out all the Levites. They changed the Torah. They told everyone, you have to worship in northern Israel, not in Jerusalem anymore. So all the Levites left their positions, fled to Judah and Jerusalem, and they lost all their cities in the north. And now, I just want you to, to read this. Okay, so Jerobo Jeroboam and his sons had cast off from executing the priest's office, Okay, unto the Lord, and he ordained him priests for the high places, these are pagan places, polytheistic places to worship, 
and for the devils. Now, that's a Greek word. It shouldn't be here. If we actually go to the Greek, if we go to the Septuagint and see what it's saying, it's not devils. This is clearly idols. They set up golden calves. They're not worshiping the devil. They're worshiping idols that aren't real. Just like we learned, Lucifer is a Roman god. He's not the dark lord of the universe. He's a idol. He's not real. So I just wanted to point that out. So now when we go to the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, what do we notice? Okay, we're going to notice that the first kingdoms, Babylon, which is really a branch of Neo-Assyria, okay, the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar was coming from an Assyrian family of princes, and um, they rebelled against the Assyrian Empire and took them. And this is the Aramaic Peshitta, and this is the really the Aramaic Bible that we have, and the most complete oldest one we have is from the 5th century. And it's the languages, it's left to us in the languages spoken by these kingdoms, okay? And then when we go to the next, the Greek Septuagint, the oldest we have is from the 4th century. It's most complete, but we have fragments going back to about 100, you know, 2nd century BC. And these, this is the language left to us by the Greek kingdoms. And then we're going to have the Latin Vulgate, which was left to us by Jerome, and this was also translated in the 4th century. And this is the language spoken by the Roman Empire. Okay, so the manuscripts that we have are the legacies from all these great empires. And I think it's such a beautiful thing that these manuscript languages are also confirming the story from the Bible. Okay, so now we're really going to talk about this Aryan, Greek, and Semitic Hebrew conflict. And we're going to look at, we're going to focus on mainly these two Old Testament manuscripts. Just because these are the dominant manuscripts... And um, we don't, I don't really have time to go through all of them, but we are going to look at some, we're going to bring the Samaritan Pentateuch in sometimes when there's a disagreement. And let's just look at the timeline. Let's look at where we are today in the present day. And you're going to find yourself in one of these four camps, really. You're probably either a Protestant, you're either a Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, or you're a Muslim. And now we have the Jews coming back, creating the state of Israel. Now we don't know why, they would call their country Israel. They're the house of Judah. They were at war with the house of Israel, but they're, they're using the name Israel of the people they were at war with because this is the only way they're going to be able to kind of pass themselves off as the chosen people. Okay, so we have the Protestant Reformation, the division between the Catholics and the Protestants. We're going to have the fall of Constantinople in 1453. This is crucial. This is the capital of Eastern Christianity, or really Christianity, the city of Constantine, the guy who turned the Roman Empire Christian. We're going to talk about him. Uh, then we're going to have the Great Schism in 1054, the division, the final divorce between the Eastern Orthodox, the Greek-speaking church, and the Latin-speaking church. Okay, And then just before that, we're going to have our oldest Jewish manuscripts coming into existence. The Leningrad Codex is really the most complete. This is the main one. The Aleppo Codex is a little older, but it was destroyed in a fire uh, not that long ago, and then it disappeared from Syria and reappeared in Jerusalem a couple decades, I think a decade later or something, and a lot of the books were burnt and destroyed. And then we have the 10th century Sassoon Codex, and this only has 24 books. Um, it's about as old as maybe the Aleppo Codex. Uh, it's named after the Sassoon family, and if you know the history of the Chinese Opium War, when British ships European ships were filling China with Jewish opium. The Jews were the opium dealers during this time. The Sassoon family, they're known as the Rothschilds of the East. They're married into the Rothschild family. They're like the Rothschilds of Eastern, of the Eastern part of the world, Iraqi, um, Mizrahi Jews, uh, and um, they were very big in India too, and they, they were the ones really filling up China with drugs. So right now we have China filling up our country with drugs. We've got the Chinese filling up our country with methamphetamine and fentanyl. But understand that we were doing this to China. The British ships were importing opium, Jewish opium, and the Sassoon family played a massive role, and this codex is named after this family. Okay, so we have Islam coming in, in 620 AD, and then just before that, we're going to have the... the um, Rome is now going to become Christian, and the Bible is going to come under imperial sponsorship, and this is why we see all these manuscripts showing up, exactly in history when the persecution of Christians stopped. So we have Christ, the destruction, siege of Jerusalem, it's destroyed, persecution, 
persecution of Christians. And let's we're going to zoom in on this right now. So let's talk about this. And here we have the first 400 years of Christianity. And we have the time of Jesus and the apostles. And this whole period under here, all the way up to Ju Emperor Julian, is going to be a period of Christian persecution. They're going to have a couple decades in between where there's peace. It's going to really start crucifixion of Jesus. You're going to have some of the, the, the main apostles are going to be killed here, uh, like James. And we're going to have Stephen the martyr. And then we have the big persecution where Nero really uh, authorized the destruction of, Christ of Christians, okay? And then it's going to lead to the destruction of the temple, the destruction of Jerusalem. This is the first Jewish revolt. And we're also going to have some persecution under Domitian. Trajan, uh, later, now this is a very fascinating persecution. There's some letters between Pliny and Trajan. And this is actually uh, when the Romans, a light bulb was starting to go off in the Romans' head. Trajan persecuted Christians, but he didn't want to. What they were noticing was it was much easier to govern an empire with Christians than it was with the polytheists, who we call the pagans. Now, understand that during this period is the Christian pagan period. Christians are the pagans. Pagan means peasant, and the peasant religion during this time, the pagan religion, was Christianity. And then at the end, when it becomes the imperial religion, the names are going to switch. Pagans are no longer going to be Christians. Pagans are going to be those who believe in polytheism. So what Trajan realized, you know, Pliny's kind of like, I don't know what to do with these. What do I do with these Christians? Because, well, these Christians don't sacrifice animals. They govern themselves. They pay their taxes. They're never in our courts. They settle their disputes amongst themselves. They gov they're a self-governing people. We don't have to do anything with these Christians. They're very easy to manage. We can really build an empire with these people. We don't have these internal problems that we're having with the drunken polytheists, okay, and their crazy festivals and their animal sacrificing. Who believes in blood magic? It's not the Christians. Jesus ended all of that. We're going to talk about that because I'm hearing this argument that, oh, you Christians believe in blood magic. Well, okay, we're going we're gonna to talk about that. But my point here is this is when the light bulb is starting to go off in some of the Romans' heads where it's like, wow, you know what? It is far easier to build an empire with Christians than it is with polytheists. And this is going to bring us to the second Jewish revolt, Keto's War. And when you come to this event, this is a very evil moment in history. The Jews backstabbed the Romans. Okay, they plotted with the Parthian Empire. And the moment that the Roman legions left Rome to go fight the Persians, the Jews launched a revolution and they murdered half a million Romans and Greeks in this little revolutionary Quito's War. So this is a very evil event. Half a million, almost half a million people were massacred, women, children, all the men would left to go to war and the Jews to get revenge for the, the destruction of Jerusalem, backstabbed the Romans, waited for their armies to leave and then slaughtered almost half a million people. Okay, then we're going to have the third Jewish revolt with Simon Bar Kokhba. And this is where you get Stalin's name. Stalin's nickname was Koba, and he's named after this Jewish revolutionary. And I want you to really think about that. Okay, so you're going to have some, uh, some persecutions with Valerian. And the big persecution is going to happen under Diocletian and Galerius. Galerius is going to end it. They're realizing now, you know what, every Christian we kill, a hundred more convert and take their place. So something's wrong here. We have to stop this. They're burning down churches, they're massacring Christians, and it's not working. And that's going to lead to the Constantine, the Edict of Milan, the Council of Nicaea, and this is where you're going to see all these codices come into creation, which is perfect history. It wouldn't make sense for us to have coded, like complete Bibles from this time. Okay, It doesn't match the history. And now and we're going to talk about Emperor Julian in a moment, and Emperor Julian is the last polytheistic emperor who made an alliance with the Jews and the two of them together wanted to, they wanted to rebuild a third temple and Julian and the Jews were working together to bring back animal sacrificing, blood magic rituals. Okay, it's not the Christians, it's the polytheists, the pagans. Okay, now they're going to become the pagans during this era. So when we look at the rise of Christianity, this is, the, this is the first century. So this is what the book of Revelation is about. The ten Caesars, Nero is the sixth. 
His name equals 666 in Hebrew. This is the man that John is writing about who's going to usher in the Christian persecution backed by the Roman Empire. And he's going to eventually be forced to commit suicide, and Galba's going to take his place. Galba's going to make Otho his right-hand man. Gal so Galba's the seventh. Otho is the eighth. Okay, and we're gonna, this is very important that Otho is the eighth, because he's going to be mentioned in the book of Revelation. And when Otho comes into power, he was Nero's lover. And they also shared a wife, okay, Pompeia Sabina, who was a Jewish convert. Okay, the wife of Nero and the wife of Otho was obsessed with Judaism, and she was a Jewish convert. She was even buried in the custom of the Jews. She wasn't buried as a Roman. And Otho is going to uh, take over from Galva. He's going to become Caesar, and he's going to he's going to bring back Neronian worship and start to finish the work Nero started. And uh, he's even going to sign his letters as Nero himself. So he's going to be like Nero reborn. So he's a very important Caesar. He's going to tie into the book of Revelation. He's overthrown by Vitalius. And then the 10th Caesar, the general who was destroying the Jews, is now going to become the first, you know, he's going to, he's going to take over uh, the empire. He's going to restore Rome and him and his son are going to rule, and they're going to start the Flavian dynasty, and Josephus is going to be adopted by him, and this is where we're going to get the accounts of what happened in Jerusalem. And when we come to the 4th century, we're going to have a very similar event. We're also going to have Diocletian and his tetriarch, okay? And so he's going to divide his empire and really create four Caesars, and we're going to have uh, uh, Constantine, who's going to emerge, and he's really the Caesar that has the greatest legacy in the history of Rome. Okay? His legacy still exists in the form of the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Churches. Okay? And he's going to defeat Maxentius here. He's going to march on Rome. He's then going to make an alliance with Licinius. Licinius is his brother-in-law. Uh, and, and then Licinius is going to rule the pagan empire. He's going to rule the Christian empire. And they're going to go into civil war. Galerius is going to die. I think he died of a disease. And he really stopped, he hated Christians, but he did stop the, the Diocletian uh, massacre on Christians because it just wasn't working. And then Constantine is going to turn the empire Christian. So I just want to show this because I think this is hilarious. This is Con Constantius, this is the father of Constantine. And this is where, I want you to notice, in Western Europe, France, Germany, Netherlands, Belgium today, England, Wales, and Scotland. This is really the birth of the Roman Church. Uh, I want you to think of how funny that is, that it's going to be the men and the Caesar from Britain. Okay, uh, Constantine was crowned in York, in uh, Ubericum, and uh, Constantine's going to be crowned in York, and it's going to be these men and these legions from Western Europe that are going to march on Rome and then eventually turn the, the Roman Empire Christian. So where does Orthodoxy and Catholicism really begin? It actually, funny enough, it is started by the men from Western Europe, which will eventually become the Protestants later on. And I just think that's, that's really interesting, that Western Europeans and these men are going to be the ones who turn Europe Christian. It's actually not going to come from, the, from Rome or from Byzantium, Constantinople. It's going to come from England. So the last polytheistic emperor of Rome, and we're just going to talk about this just because I'm hearing, and I know where it's coming from, oh, you Christians, you believe in blood magic rituals, you know, and let's just kind of put something into perspective. All right, so the word sacrifice, all right, comes from Latin, and it's two Latin words, sacer and facio, or fice, sacrifice, it means to make sacred. Sacrifice means to make sacred. Now, in ancient Rome, uh, the word sacer, sacred, it kind of has two meanings. It, on one hand, it could mean holy, but you also didn't want to be sacer. It means you're separated from the communitas. You're separated from the community. Where are the gods? The gods don't live with man. The gods are outside of our realm. They're sacer. They're sacred. They're outside the republic. They're outside the communitas. And you, as a person, as a mortal man or mortal woman, you don't want to be kicked out of the communitas. You want to be part of society. So if you did something wrong, you were considered sacer. You were outside. You were like, the gods are outside. You don't want to be sacer. So what you have to do is you have to make 
something sacre. You have to do a sacrifice. You have to do a sacrifice. And you would do that by taking an animal, putting your sins. You'd have to get a priest to do this ritual for you. Put your sins on the animal, kill the animal, and then you can now, the animal has become sacer for you, and you can now rejoin society. So this, this is very similar to even what the Jews were doing. And so animal sacrifice is a big part of polytheism. So when people want to return to their pre-Christian era, for me it's insanity. You want to worship your ancestors and be like your ancient pre-Christian ancestors? Well, you're going to have to start sacrificing animals. You guys are the ones who believe that animal blood can atone for your, your transgressions, your sins. Christians ended that. Christians stopped animal sacrifices. Do you want to go back to a pre-Christian era where you have to bow down to statues of the Roman emperor, call him God, sacrifice animals? You really want to return... Do you know how many Christians had to die? How many Europeans sacrificed their lives to end this system of animal sacrifice and bowing down to statues of the emperor and worshiping him as a god? you want to return to that? I don't think so. And instead of being thankful to the Christians who ended that, it's they want to return to this system and they just hate Christians. We believe in blood magic, but we're not the ones who sacrifice animals. Uh, what we're trying to say is we are saved by the blood of Jesus. And the point is that in Christianity, we believe that death comes through sin. And that when a, a man who finally lived a sinless life, death had no claim over the life of Jesus. Okay, so we can go over some examples that for he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made righteous of God in him. Uh, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death, a death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. So death is coming. The reason we're all cursed with death and why we need Christ is because Christ never sinned. He was a sinless man, and yet death took him, and death had no legal claim. It's like the laws of the universe were broken when we crucified Christ, which is why he was resurrected, because death had no claim over him. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of uh, God is, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we're not the ones who believe in blood magic sacrificing. This is polytheists. This is Jews. And Emperor Julian was in alliance with the Jews, the last polytheistic emperor, to bring back this system. He tried to undo what Constantine and the Christians had done. So if you really want to return to blood magic rituals, pre-Christian era and bowing down to statues of your leaders, well, I just, I don't know what to say to you. Okay, and we're going to look at some traditions. So we can look at the Saturnalia, which is Christmas today. And here's an example of how, you know, Christmas is not a biblical thing. Christian Christmas is pure polytheist, polytheistic tradition. And I'm, I'm not against Christ, Christmas, if you, you know, I celebrate Christmas in a way, and um, I think it's a great time for people to get together, and it's also a great time to talk about history and talk about what life was like before Christianity. And to me, Christmas really represents Christ's triumph over the pagan gods. Uh, you know, Jesus obviously wasn't born at Christmas time, um, he was probably born in the fall or late summer. Actually, I believe Jesus was actually born on September 11th. Um, and that's why 9-11 is such actually uh, an interesting day. I think Jesus was born at around, you know, Yom Kippur. And um, so Christmas is not um, a Christian holiday. It's not in the Bible, where Hanukkah is a biblical tradition. Okay, but why do we celebrate Christmas? Is because it's passed down to us by our, in, our European ancestors. And I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but this is just showing us that when Rome went from a polytheistic empire, they didn't abandon the traditions. They just tur turned the, the traditions, uh, they just painted it with a Christian brush. And where Hanukkah actually is a biblical tradition, and the prophecy of Hanukkah is in the Old Testament and is only mentioned in the New Testament. So Hanukkah is fascinating because it's not in the Old Testament. It's mentioned in the New Testament here, okay, in John 10. And it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of Dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple of Solomon's porch. We're going to talk about 
the, the prophecy of Hanukkah because it's going to bring us uh, through history to the creation of the Septuagint Bible. Okay, so let's talk about the prophecy of Hanukkah. And we're going to go to Daniel chapter 8 and 11, and here you're going to find the prophecy of Hanukkah. Okay, and it's going to bring us to the Greek kings from the Persian Empire. So what you're going to notice here is there's a he-goat, okay, and he's smashing into a, a ram that has two horns, and one horn is bigger than the other. And this is going to talk about Greece and the Persian Empire. And I'm just going to kind of go through this really quick. So in the reign of Belshazzar, so we're talking about Daniel now. We talked about Daniel in the last video, if you remember, when he's talking about Darius, or talking to Darius the Mede, telling him the whole future of the Greeks coming. And how did Daniel know this history about the Greeks? Well, he knew because of this dream that he had. So in his dream, he's, bring, he's brought to Susa, Shushan, in the province of Elam. And this is going to be the administrative capital of the Persian Empire. It's not the capital of the Persian Empire, but they couldn't run the empire from their capital city. And in his dream, he saw a ram standing by a river, and it had two horns, okay? And the horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. So one horn is, is Persia, the smaller one, and the taller one is the Midians that Persia, that Cyrus is going to conquer, take over their kingdom from his grandfather. And that's why the, the smaller, the, the larger one comes up last, because the smaller kingdom is going to be the one commanding this larger kingdom. And look at the directions now. This is very important. Okay, what direction is the Persian Empire moving in? It's moving westward, northward, and southward. And we're going to talk about this in a moment. And it was moving with such power, pushing in these directions, that no beast, no empire might stand before him. A horn generally represents a king or a kingdom. And uh, so neither was there any that could be delivered out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. And as I was standing, behold, a he-goat came from the west, from Greece, on the face of the whole earth, and touched not the ground. This is talking about the speed that the Greeks are going to come and smash into this ram, into the Medo-Persia. Okay, and the goat had a notable horn, a notable king or kingdom between his eyes, talking about Alexander the Great and the kingdom of Macedonia. The king that was put in charge of this Greek hegemony or oligarchy that's now going to conquer Persia. And he came to the ram that had two horns, okay, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran uh, unto him in fury, in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with choler against him, and smote the ram and broke his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast him to the ground and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hands. Okay, so Alexander is going to smash Medo-Persia. And, you know, Alexander, you can say a lot of bad things about him, but, he, you know, to me, I think he was a really very fascinating person from history. When he conquered Persia, you know, he took over uh, the capital, the city, and the king fled you know, ran for his life and left his mom and his family in the capital. And Alexander really took the Persian king's family on and adopted them and made them his family and treated them as if they were his own, you know, mother and, and, and sisters. He didn't have them raped or killed or anything like that. Alexander revered the Achaemenid dynasty, revered Cyrus the Great. I would say that, that Alexander the Great was far more the son of Cyrus the Great than any of his descendants. Alexander and Cyrus had so much in common, and Alexander had the utmost respect for this dynasty. So let's talk about Medo-Persia for a second. We're going to go back. Let's remember the directions that this empire is pushing. And now the Persians solidified their position along the Indus River in India, and Cyrus is going to go north, and this is where Cyrus is actually going to die. He's going to die trying to take the Scythian tribes in the north, and he's actually going to be killed by a woman named Tamaris. And Tamar, Tamar Us, anything with the ending Us, like Sai Rus, Berai Us, Tamar Rus, okay, is a Greek ending. You know it's a Greek word if it ends with this Us at the end, okay? Uh, Egyptus, okay, the Greek way to say Egypt, Egyptus. Um, even the gods of Egypt, Horus, that ending is telling you these are Greek words. So he's going to die being killed by a woman named Tamar. 
And Tamar is a pure Israelite name. It's the matriarch of the tribe of Judah. And it's ironic that this is where the Israelites were living in the north, and Cyrus is going to be killed by a woman named Tamar, which is an Israelite name. And uh, now there's conflicting reports, right? This is the Herodotus report. Xenophon, who wrote later in history, Xenophon is one of my favorite people from ancient history, the, the famous March of the 10,000. Xenophon is a student of Socrates. Uh, um, uh, Xenophon was a young man and went on a secret mission with 10,000 Greek mercenaries to overthrow the Persian king and put his brother on the throne. And it's a really remarkable story, the March of the 10,000 and Xenophon. And it's, 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 it's really Game of Thrones. It's, it's, it's such a fascinating secret mission to overthrow the Persian king that everything goes wrong and the Greeks have to now run for their lives. And none of these Greeks even knew why they were there. It was secret. The soldiers had no idea what their mission was until they got here. And then everything goes wrong and they have to run for their lives. And the Greeks actually make it out and come back. They make it to the Black Sea. They run from the Persian capital. And Xenophon barely makes it back home to Greece only to discover that his master Socrates was killed. It's an amazing story. I wish I could talk about it more. But Xenophon says Cyrus died of old age, while Herodotus, who was closer to Cyrus, says no, Cyrus died in battle. And I, as much as I love Xenophon, I do side a little bit more with Herodotus on this one. Um, okay, so he's going north. Remember the directions, okay? So north, and then we have Cambyses who went south, and he's going to die here, the son of Cyrus. And where does Darius go? Darius goes west. And he's not going to die in battle, but he will die failing to conquer the Greeks. And this is what's going to start the whole Persian-Greek conflict is something called the Ionian Revolt, where the Ionians uh, revolted against the Persians. And this is going to bring us to the Battle of Marathon. And this is where we get our races today. The Marathon race, the distance from Marathon to Athens. And um, Darius is going to fail. He's going to be uh, beaten. His general, Darius isn't fighting in the battle, but his general is, and he's going to be, be defeated by the great Ionian general Miltiades, okay, or Miltiades. And Miltiades, uh, this is such an amazing moment in Greek history. 10,000 Greek uh, soldiers, hoplites, made their stand against the Persians. Uh, a, a unbelievable victory. I wish I could talk more about it, but, you know, the Greeks did something rather amazing, that they've never done before, and that they will never do again. And that is, they buried their dead on the field of Marathon. The, the Greek custom was when you die, you burn the body, because they believed in cremation, and then you put the ashes in an urn, and then you can bury the urn um, in a grave or um, in a tomb or something. You, you know, you put the, the, the urn with the, your ancestors. But the Greeks aren't going to do that here. They actually buried their dead and we actually, exactly as we read in Herodotus, uh, we found the burial and we found the helmet of Miltiades where he dedicated his helmet to Zeus after, you know, after this great victory. So the directions of the, that Daniel is giving is perfect history and you can learn a lot from this. Okay, and now we're going to talk about when we come to Hanukkah. And now we're going to notice how the story ends for this goat, this he-goat that destroyed the Persian Empire. Okay, and when he was very great, when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and it came up four notable ones towards the four winds of heaven. And out of them came four little horns, which waxed exceedingly great. Now, pay attention to two of these horns, the one in the south and the one in the east. And they were going towards the pleasant land. This is the land of Israel. And it waxed great even to the hosts of heavens, and it cast down some of the hosts of the stars to the ground and, st and stamped upon them. Uh, he magnified himself even to the prince of the hosts, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away. This is not the daily sacrifices mentioned in Daniel 12. These are the daily sacrifices that the, the Greeks are going to remove the worship of God from the Jewish temple and install Zeus worship and start sacrificing pigs. And this is going to bring us to Hanukkah. And these, this is what he's talking about, the daily sacrifices taken away. And the reason this is important is because here's the kingdom in the east and the kingdom in the south. 
Where is the Septuagint going to come from? It's going to come from the Ptolemies in the south here. And Israel, Judah, is going to be this buffer state between the kingdom of the east, the kingdom of the south, and they're going to war against each other over Judah to the point where the Greeks get so fed up with these Jews that they remove the temple sacrifices, remove the temple, install a temple to Zeus, and now you're going to get the Maccabean revolt. And uh, the reason, the Maccabees won a tremendous victory, but they couldn't hold the victory. What the Maccabees end up doing is they go to the Romans and ask the Romans for help, and they get a contract with Rome granting them protection. So who brought the Romans into Judea was the Maccabees, because the Maccabees couldn't hold Jerusalem and Judea from the Greeks. But once the Maccabees had this treaty, and we can read about this treaty in the first book of Maccabees, I think it's in chapter 8, you can read the treaty of the Jews to the Romans, and the Jews are begging the Romans, please come and help us. And uh, the Greeks, once the Jews secured this alliance with the Romans, the Greeks went, you know what, we can't attack them. If we attack the Jews, we're bringing the Romans into our lands, okay? And the Greeks were now scared of the Romans. So here we have our, 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 our notable horn that gets destroyed. We're going to have, uh, uh, you know, Cassander in the west, Lysimachus in the north, Seleucus in the east, and Ptolemy. And his son is going to commission the work for the, king, for the Septuagint Bible. And you can see God is preparing the world for his coming, and for the, for the coming of Christ, okay? So we're going to talk about that. Uh, and But first I want to talk about, so God is preparing the world for the coming of the New Testament. Okay, so now the Old Testament is going to be translated into Aryan Greek and circulated throughout the Greek-speaking world, preparing the coming of the New Testament, okay, the New Covenant. And the Old Testament to me is really the New Testament concealed. You can see that the New Testament is concealed within the pages of the Old Testament. And we're going to see that, uh, that the New Testament is really the Old Testament revealed. And you can't separate these books. Now you're going to have the Quran, the Book of Mormon, books that come later. But they're really, they don't make any sense. Because these two complete each other. And God is preparing the way with the Ptolemies. And all this history and the coming of the Romans, and he's preparing the way so that the New Testament can be proclaimed throughout all the world. So let's talk about the, uh, the New Testament uh, being hidden in the Old Testament. And we're going to look at the story of Isaac. Okay, for instance, Isaac was the promised son of Abraham, as Christ was the promised son of God. Isaac was born of a miracle birth, as Christ was born of a miracle birth. Isaac carried the wood up the hill to be sacrificed. Christ carried the wood, right, his cross, up the hill to be sacrificed. Isaac was willing to be sacrificed. Christ was willing to be sacrificed. The story of Isaac is about resurrection. Christ was resurrected. So it's very important for us to understand that God never told Abraham to sacrifice his son. Okay, a lot of people are angry at this story because, oh, what, what kind of God would ask Abraham to sacrifice his son. So let's put something into perspective here, that God actually said to Abraham, offer him, not sacrifice him, I want you to offer him. And God is going to stop the sacrifice because God never asked him to sacrifice his son. What's being told in this story is actually the story of resurrection. Because if Abraham kills Isaac, if he actually sacrifices him, I want you to think about this. Well, Abraham is only sacrificing Isaac because of all the promises that God made to Abraham regarding Isaac. Uh, so, in order for all the promises that God made to Abraham about Isaac to come true, if Abraham were to sacrifice him, the only logical conclusion is, Abraham must have believed God can resurrect Isaac after he's sacrificed. Otherwise, all the promises that were made couldn't come true. How could Isaac be the father of many nations? How could the world be blessed through Isaac's children if Abraham kills him and God doesn't resurrect him? So this is a story of resurrection, no matter how you cut it. So next, God provided a ram, a male lamb, for the sacrifice. Stopped, You know, he stopped Abraham, and then God provides the sacrifice. And God provided Christ, the Lamb of God, for the sacrifice. So the inside the story of Isaac is the story of Christ. Okay, let's look at the story of Joseph. 
Joseph was the chosen son of Israel. Christ was the chosen son of God. Joseph was betrayed by his brothers. Christ was betrayed by the Jews, his brethren. Judah sold Joseph for silver. Judas sold Christ for silver. Joseph was unjustly thrown into prison and beaten. Christ was unjustly arrested and beaten. Joseph interprets dreams for Pharaoh's wine cup bearer and baker. Here we have symbols for bread and wine. Christians remember Christ's sacrifice with bread and wine. Joseph was risen to the right hand of Pharaoh. Christ was risen to the right hand of God. The son Israel thought was dead was alive. Christ was resurrected. The son who was dead was alive. Joseph's name means, he will add, and his brother Benjamin's name means, son on the right. Christ was the son added on the right. So that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God. Okay, Jesus said, I am, and ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Uh, we can see it in the story of Moses. The Egyptians and Israelites who believed were saved by the blood of the Lamb. And that's important that Egyptians and Israelites, Israelites and Gentiles together, who believe were saved by the blood of the Lamb. We are saved by the blood of Christ, okay, the Lamb of God. The stories of Abraham and Moses involve bread and wine, or the blood of a lamb. Christians remember the story of Christ and the Passover with bread and wine. God destroys Egypt with plagues. God destroyed Judea with the plagues of Egypt. The Israelites were baptized crossing the Red Sea. Christ and the apostles baptized believers. Israelites and Gentiles were joined together at Sinai. Israelites and Gentiles are joined together in Christ. And that's very important to mention that even with the old covenant with Moses, that there was a mixed multitude of various nationalities with the Israelites and that Gentiles and Israelites were joined together at Sinai. Okay, there were Egyptians, there were Midianites, there were lots of people from various tribes Moses established uh, the temple and its rituals. Christ destroyed the temple and its rituals. Moses brought the law. Christ abolished the law. Moses descended from Mount Sinai twice, the first time breaking the tablets, the second time in glory. Christ descended from heaven twice, the first time his body was broken, the second time in glory. The name Moses means drawn out of water. He was drawn out of the river Nile. Christ and his followers were baptized and drawn out of the river Jordan. The Israelites spent 40 years in the wilderness, dependent on God. Christ spent 40 days fasting in the wilderness, dependent on God. Joshua brings the Gentiles and Israelites into the promised land. Christ's name is Joshua and brings the Gentiles and Israelites into the kingdom of God. So, understand that Jesus is a Greek transliterated word. It's not his real name. If you were to translate Jesus' name properly into English, Jesus' name is Joshua. And just like how Josh, Joshua brings the Gentiles and Israelites into the Promised Land, Christ, whose name is Joshua, brings the Gentiles and, Is and Israelites into the kingdom of God. Joshua destroyed the Canaanites, and then God removed them from the land. Christ, Joshua, destroyed the Jews, and then God removed them from the land. Now let's talk about Christ inaugurated as Caesar. Hidden inside the crucifixion story is actually the inauguration of Caesar. So Christ was inaugurated secretly, if you pay attention, as Caesar. So the Caesar to be, that's about to be crowned Caesar, is brought to the Praetorium. That's the first step. Christ is brought to the Praetorium. Caesar is then given purple robes. Christ is given purple robes. Caesar is given a crown of wreaths and a scepter. Christ is given a crown of thorns and a reed. Caesar is proclaimed by the guards. Christ is mockingly proclaimed king of the Jews by the guards. Caesar is marched through the streets by the guards, just like the president of the United States is today. Christ is marched through the streets by the guards. A slave marched next to Caesar carrying an axe, which was the instrument of death, for the sacrificial bull. Simon of Cyrene helped Christ carry his cross, the instrument of death, as Christ was the sacrifice. Caesar is led to Capitolian Hill, which in Latin means head hill, just like the President of the United States to this day marches through the streets and is led to Capitol Hill.
Christ has led to Golgotha, which in Aramaic means skull hill or head hill. Caesar is offered wine mixed with, with mire and is refused to be poured onto the bowl, which is then sacrificed. Christ is offered wine mixed with gall and is refused, and the Bible says they crucify him. Caesar stands between his second-in-command on his right and his third-in-command on his left. Christ was crucified between two criminals, one on his right and one on his left. The ceremony of Caesar ends with a solar eclipse or the releasing of doves. The crowd and soldiers proclaim the new Caesar. So depending on the time of year, they would try to time this with a solar eclipse. Darkness covered the land, the earth quaked, the temple veil was torn in two, the crowd and centurions proclaimed Christ the Son of God. So, hidden in plain sight of the crucifixion is the inauguration of Caesar. Okay, Christ was the Passover lamb and was made ruler over the nations. So, I want you to understand something, um, that I didn't really become a Christian uh, by reading the New Testament. I would say that uh, I became a Christian when I studied the Old Testament. After I was halfway through the book of Matthew, you know, I'll be honest, I started to cry like a baby, and I had a nervous breakdown. I threw my Bible across the room, uh, or maybe across my bed, uh, because I knew what I was reading was the truth. I spent my whole life hating Jesus because of how much I hated Christians and church hypocrisy. I couldn't believe that I was so deceived by Christians and the vain mainstream churches. I thought, either this isn't the Bible or these people aren't Christians. After I read that Jesus threw out the bankers out of the temple, and when I understood that Jesus was at war with the religious leaders, the elites, and how the Jews had enslaved the world with debt slavery, just like today, and that religion was completely controlled by vain, man-made traditions instead of being founded on truth and God, you know, I knew something was wrong with Christianity in the churches. Christians today are like the Pharisees in the Gospel, where church traditions are more important than following Jesus. And if that wasn't true, then why have Jewish bankers taken over the world? Why has the entire Christian world been brainwashed into worshipping these Jewish Pharisees? and that they're the chosen people. There was only one time in the gospel when Jesus became angry and violent, and that was when he saw the bankers in the temple engaging in usury, selling religion, and perverting justice. Why aren't we as Christians doing the same as Jesus? Why aren't we becoming violently angry at our politicians who have allowed Jewish bankers to enslave all of our nations with usury? Shouldn't we be violent and angry and chase these vipers out of our governments, out of our courthouses, and out of our churches? Isn't that what Jesus did? But of course, you know, Christians won't, because church, church traditions. And following these, you know, these charlatan pastors and priests is more important than following Christ. So we have to bunker down for the end of the world, okay, which is never ending, Every generation thinks that they're the generation where the world's going to end, but it never comes. They have us paralyzed in fear, okay, because of some, you know, nonsense end of days lie that the world is going to blow up and that the Greco-Roman the Greco god Lucifer is going to come down to put computer chips in all of our hands and that Jesus has to battle the Antichrist at the Battle of Armageddon and then, you know, the Jews will all become Christian and we'll all just be singing Kumbaya by the fire and dancing with lollipops and, and singing to rainbows. None of this is true. So because of the Pharisees and vain church traditions that aren't in the Bible, we have forsaken the core teachings of Christ and given the keys to our financial institutions, our media, our schools, our governments, to the vilest, the vilest and most evil people who have ever walked this earth. If you follow Christ, if you follow his example, then you would be violently angry at what these people have done to your countries. There was one European country in recent history that actually managed to do this, where they, where they removed these bankers from power and violently kicked them out of their countries. They freed their people from debt slavery. They had the greatest economic recovery in world history. And then they became the most hated country and people in the world. Okay, I'll give you a hint of who I'm talking about. My channel name was inspired by them.
Anyways, we're going to move on. That's just me kind of going on a rant. We're going to talk about this, you know, Aryan Greek Semitic conflict. And um, we're going to point out, so this is our oldest, most complete Septuagint Bible, our oldest, most complete Jewish Masoretic Bible. They're obviously translated from a much older Bible, right? And let's just put some things into perspective. Okay, that no book in antiquity, antiquity has been preserved like the Bible. Uh, we do not possess any original books with autographs from any biblical author. That's very important. At most, at best, we have copies of copies of copies. We do not have the original books. The vast majority of Bible manuscripts were preserved in Latin, and we're going to talk about why that is. Let's uh, just put some things into perspective. The original Hebrew Bible is missing in action. We only have copies. But this is the most documented book in all of ancient history, left to us in all the languages from the ancient empires, and we don't have the original. I do believe somewhere in the world there probably is an original Hebrew, and I, do, I don't believe they'll ever release it if they have it. Okay, It'll be by pure luck that we find it. Uh, but we have these versions, so we have to look at the mistakes in them, compare them with the fragments we have from history, and this is how we're going to figure out what the Bible is actually trying to tell us. Let's talk about the Aryan Semitic conflict and the sons of Noah, because this is going to explain, right, where we're talking about a Greek Bible written in the Aryan language by Jewish Semitic scribes. Okay, so we have to understand this conflict, which really begins with the sons of Noah at the Tower of Babylon. Now, I don't believe that all the races of the world were here, and that, you know, if these three were brothers from the same parents, then they would share the same genetic structure. Uh, I don't believe that the Semites gave birth to the Asians and that the Japhites are the white people and the Egyptians are the black people. I don't think so. I think these are the Caucasian races. They're the sons of Noah. They're the sons of, of Adam. And that there are multiple people created. We're going to talk about this a little bit later. So let's just kind of put some things into perspective that when we're talking about um, these, these nationalities, these races, where do, they, where do the languages divide? Where do we see the Aryan language? the Semitic language, and the Egyptian language. They're all going to scatter exactly where the Tower of Babylon is. Okay, so this is where the languages divide. Okay, it's very interesting. And the Ark landed in Armenia. It landed in the mountains of Ararat. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about this prophecy. But first, what I want to point out, Armenia, where the Ark landed, that it was named after one of the sons of, Sh of Shem, Aram, and this is where we get the country Armenia from, okay? So we're going to talk about these boring names in the book of Genesis really quickly and show you that, you know, like Asher, this is where we get Assyria from. Mede is where we get Midia from. Elam, like we talked about in the last video, this is where the Elamites come from, the Persians come from, and the province is still called Elam to this day. Lud is where we get the name Lydia. Yavan, or Ivan, is where we get Yonia. Okay, and these are the Greeks. These are one faction of the Greeks. They're not the Dorian Greeks. These are very specifically like the Athenians, um, I guess the Ephesians, um, people from, I think, Miletus. These are the, the people in Ionia. I want you to pay attention to the name J Japheth, Japetus. In Greek mythology, the, the, the son of Gaia, one of the sons is Japheth. Okay, and it's, gonna, it's very similar to the flood story. Same thing in Egypt, Kemet, Cam, okay, so where we get this name from. And in the Egyptian religion, if you study the story of the Ogdoad, the eight prime gods of Egypt, just like how eight people came out of the ark, four male, four female, if you go to the founding of Egypt and the Ogdoad, the, four, the, eight, prime, the eight gods that emerged from the waters, four female, four male, emerged from the waters to found Egypt. So... Now we're going to talk about Canaan. Okay, we're going to read this prophecy here. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So he's going to serve his brothers. God shall enlarge Japheth, the Aryans, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. Right? Why this is important? Well, all of history is going to be bouncing between Semites and Aryans, and these Canaanites who are going to make some of the world's greatest accomplishments, they're going to be erased from history, and everything they did is going to be absorbed by their two brothers, the Aryans and the Semites. 
and Canaan shall be his servant. Okay, so we have the Canaanites here. We're going to talk about them a little bit later. The rise of the Amorite Empire. It's going to tie into this history of the Exodus, the history of the Israelites and, and Abraham. And that everything these Amorites built, Hammurabi, one of the greatest ancient kingdoms, was completely absorbed by the Semites. The Israelites absorbed Canaan. The Canaanites built the greatest ancient naval empire in history, and it was absorbed. Okay, they founded Carthage. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how the Canaanites founded Carthage and that the Romans are going to absorb everything the Canaanites built. These Aryans are going to absorb and then erase them from history. Okay, these are, this is also an uh, Israelite um, Canaanite colony, and Rome comes to power by defeating them and absorbing all their stuff. Okay, and the Bible says here their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. And we could still see that these boring genealogies that, and I'm not even, I'm not including all of them. I'm just putting some up here. But a lot of these lands are still called by the names of those people in those boring, boring genealogies in Genesis, which to me are not boring at all. And all of history is going to hang on this prophecy, this conflict between the Aryans and the Semites. And we're going to talk about the Aryan conquest. So when we're coming to the time of Jesus, Aryans are ruling the world, both. Okay, now this is an Aryan uh, empire, the Parthians, but they're really ruling over Semitic kingdoms. And Rome is actually Greco-Roman. All of southern Italy, okay, it was called Magna Graecia. All of southern Italy were Greek colonies. So when we say Romans, we're, it's, it's Greco-Roman. And the language of commerce in the Roman Empire wasn't Latin, it was Greek. And just like the Parthians, the Persians here, the Medo-Persians, their language, they're using a Semitic language. So we have an Aryan language, we have a Semitic language, Japhetic language, right? Uh, and then Shem, right? Language from Shem. Armenia is going to be a buffer state, and so is Israel. Now, okay, so here we have Greco-Roman, Greek, Aryan speaking in the West. From Jerusalem to Britain, Greek was the language of commerce, okay, during the time of Jesus. From Jerusalem to China and India, Aramaic, Syriac, was the language spoken, okay, eastwards. And in Jerusalem, you have Greek Jews, Aramaic Jews, and they are at, at war with each other. There's a uh, cultural conflict between the Western Jews and the Eastern Jews. And in Judea, you really have Greek and Aramaic uh, speakers. And one language extends all the way to China and India. The other language, Greek, is going to extend all the way to Britain. So you can see the hand of God in this story preparing the way for the coming of the New Testament, okay, preparing the world with the Greek Septuagint, and then the, the, the Hebrew scriptures are also written in Aramaic, going in both directions, okay? This is amazing. So this is, the, this is where you can see Arians are ruling the world, Japhites. Okay, now we're going to look at, later in history, we're going to have the Islamic Semitic con uh, conquest, and now the rules have switched for us. Where are the Canaanites? Canaanites are gone. They're absorbed by the Aryans and the Semites. All their accomplishments, everything they did. And now we have Semites fighting back and they're in our lands now. And we're just gonna, and we're gonna pay attention here to Constantinople, okay, it's very important. But so by 637, 638, the Arabs have taken Jerusalem. Now they're gonna push all the way, they're gonna take all these lands here. Egypt, Christian, Syria, Christian, Armenia, Christian, Carthage, like Tunisia, was Christian. Spain, Christian. These are all, actually, Spain was German. All of this was Germanic land. These were all German tribes here until the Arabs come out and the Semites conquer them. And then we're going to have the fall of Constantinople, the city of Constantine. The capital of Christianity is going to be taken by the Muslims in 1453. And this is why Latin is the prime source most manuscripts are preserved in Latin because what happened to our, our Coptic-speaking churches? What happened to our Aramaic-speaking churches? What happened to our Greek-speaking churches? They were all conquered by the Muslims. And then we're going to get the famous Gates of Vienna. And these Ottomans were ruthless 
people, absolutely ruthless people. They were the kind of people that when they conquered Christian lands, they would kill the people, sell the young girls. If you were a young Christian girl, you would be sold into sex slavery. You'd be auctioned off in the harems for sex slavery. If you were a young boy, you would be taken to the, the barracks and you'd be trained to be a Janissary soldier so that you could be used on the front lines to die for Muslims. You'd be, you know, Christian children that are now going to be on the front lines and you're going to be now used to kill more of your fellow people. That's what the Muslims were doing. If you know any Croatians or if you know any Serbians, if you want to know why these people, you know, I had a Serbian friend growing up. He was one of my best friends. And he was just the last guy you want to mess with. Okay, these people are ruthless. They're fearless. Serbians and Croatians. And if you know their, their horrible history and what happened to them, there are literally towers built from Serbia and Croatia all the way to Istanbul, which is Constantinople, made up of the skulls of dead Croatians and dead Serbians, Christians. Okay, Croatians are more Catholic. Serbians are more Orthodox. And there, you can Google the towers of Christian skulls that the Muslims built out of the heads of dead Croatians and dead Serbians. And these Muslims pushed all the way to the gates of Vienna. Don't forget how unbelievably ruthless these Muslims were. And they destroyed all these Christian lands. So why do we have more Latin manuscripts? Is because of the Semitic Islamic conquest. And... Uh, you know, if you, like the necktie, that's actually fascinating. Why do we wear neckties when we go to, to work? The necktie was actually started by Croatians and, and Serbians. The soldiers in this, re in this region, I think it was mainly Croatians, wore bandages around their neck. And when the king of France saw these soldiers, these Croatian soldiers, wearing these bandages around their necks, and I think they, they were ascots, but they were bandages, and, and he found out that, oh, they're, they're wearing these ties, these things around their neck, for when they get wounded in battle. And the king of France, where France was like obsessed with, you know, fashion and all that stuff, uh, the king of France uh, made everyone wear these ascots, these bandages, and it became a fashion statement. And that's how, you know, that's why we wear the, boat, the, the tie today when we go to work and wear a suit. It's comes from here and it comes from these Croatian and Serbians who were holding the line being brutalized and butchered having their heads being used to build Ottoman Muslim buildings and that's why we wear the necktie so the next time you put on a tie just remember that history remember that it's to do with these poor people uh, that were brutalized by the Muslims and that's why we wear neckties today I thought that was kind of interesting so let's just talk about the history of the Masoretic Bible really quickly, 10th century, okay. Uh, Masoretic comes from the Masorite scribes, okay, between the 5th and maybe 9th century, 10th century. Um, the word Masoretic is rooted in the word tradition. They preserve the vowel soundings of the Hebrew language with diacritical marks. So let's look at an example. If I were to write this word here, is it Adam or is it Edom? Because in Hebrew they could be spelt the same way. And how we differentiate between them, they very well could be the same word. Um, they both mean red, right? Adam. But how the Jews decide the sounding, the pronunciation of this word, is going to be based on these little marks here. If you look under the aleph here and look above the dalit here, um, they're not going to be the same. And this is where Jews are going to get their pronunciation from. And they based all of modern Hebrew off the work of the Masoretes. Okay, so they were only to able to relearn Hebrew because of these diacritical marks that come from the Masoretic Bible. Okay, the traditions. And that's what makes this Bible so fascinating is that it has these pronunciation marks that the old Bibles don't have. And yeah, they could be the same word or... We don't know if uh, the Jews are just inventing this. I don't know. Um, uh, that means red, and there's a, actually a dispute right now with scholars with the Red Sea, which was the, uh, the, the sea that you know, bordered into Edom. And some scholars are suggesting that, I don't, I don't know if I believe this, but they're suggesting that the reason we call it the Red Sea is because Edom means red, like Adam means red, and uh, Adam also means man. Uh, but that's where the Red Sea gets its name from, from Edom. I don't know if that's true or not. Okay, that's, they're, they're just kind of fighting about it. 
Now let's look at the Septuagint history from the 3rd century before Christ, okay, 3rd century BC. The Septuagint was translated by 70 Jewish scribes, and that's where it gets its name, Septuagint, meaning the 70. Now there's a myth surrounding this that, you know, 70 Jewish scribes, they all went off into their corners and translated the Septuagint, and they all came back with the exact same translation. Perfect. It was a miracle. This is mythology. I don't believe it happened. I believe that it was just 70 scribes wrote the Septuagint, and some scholars can point out to you, yes, different men translated the Septuagint because there's different styles being used. Um, you can see that different men wrote different sections of the Septuagint, okay? And that's the 70 Jewish translators. So again, we're now having a bunch of Semites writing in Aryan language. We have this, Sar this, this Semitic Aryan mixing coming in like we read with Noah. The Septuagint comes from the Ptolemaic, from Ptolemaic Egypt during the reign of Ptolemy II. So again, we went over the history, the dream of Daniel, the, uh, the Greeks who took over the Persian Empire, and it's going to be the southern king, Ptolemy, and his son uh, that are going to commission the work of the Septuagint Bible. And the oldest uh, uh, manuscript fragments date to the 2nd century BC, so just 100 years after they said this Bible was invented. We still have fragments. That's amazing, going back to the second century BC. Um, and uh, I want to point out that there were more Jews living in Egypt than in Judea during the time of Jesus. Uh, Alexandria, Egypt had become the center of knowledge. Uh, the great library of Alexandria was the center of knowledge of the world, okay? So the city of Alexandria was the center of knowledge during this time. If you came into Egypt with a scroll, uh, there's a high chance that they were going to seize your scroll and um, copy it, make a copy of whatever scroll you had, and then insert it into their library and give you your scroll back. They were obsessed with re recording the world's history. It was a, a remarkable library, and it was destroyed either by, some sources say Caesar destroyed it, some sources blame the Christians, and some sources blame the Muslims. Now, I would say there's a chance that all three are guilty, that it was probably damaged during the time, the Caesar's, um, you know, the, the, the chaos that happened with Caesar, uh, probably also damaged with the Christians, but I would say the Muslims are, it fits their character, they were the kind of people, if something didn't agree with Islam, they would generally destroy it, okay, depending on which, you know, caliphate was ruling, depending on which, which Muslim leader, but a lot of them were pretty ruthless, and we can look at the pyramids for an example, this is actually what the pyramids would have looked like um, before the Islamic invasion. And this is what the Muslims did to the pyramids afterwards. Okay, they, they didn't consider the pyramids very Islamic, so they removed all the beautiful limestones, the white finishing, they removed the cap, and that's why the pyramids look like this today. They would still look like this if the Muslims didn't remove the rocks to build mosques. They wanted to build mosques, so they destroyed the pyramids. So it wouldn't surprise me if they're the kind of people that would destroy the pyramids to build their mosques because the pyramids aren't very Islamic. They're the kind of people, in my opinion, that are the ones who destroyed the library. So I would put the blame on them. That's where my money is. I could be wrong. And I think actually, you know what? This is almost two hours long. Um, I'm going to stop there. Uh, we're going to stop here for now. I'm going to upload this section and I'll upload the next section maybe tomorrow. Um, <laughs> we haven't even finished manuscript history okay and we're gonna we're gonna begin the next time with the differences in the manuscripts. okay so I'm gonna have this video ready uh, right after and uh, for now you can just watch the first part and again we haven't even gone through this is a huge topic. We haven't even covered the first section, the first part of this section we still have. Uh, four more sections to go. So I'm going to end here, um, let you guys watch this, and this is where it's going to get very interesting in my opinion. Okay, so we're going to now compare the differences between the manuscripts, and we're going to start with the story of David and Goliath and show you the differences between uh, how the Septuagint gives a much different height for Goliath than the Masoretic. Okay, so I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope you guys learned something. 
um, and uh, I should have the next video up for you guys very shortly. Okay, I hope you guys are well, and um, I look forward to, to finishing this, and uh, I hope you learned something, and I hope this gives you a new perspective on how we can look at this book.